In this video, we are going to start out with the timeline portion of the Middle Ages series, and of course this is going to involve the early Middle Ages. And when we talk about the early Middle Ages, we have to talk about the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And there are two groups that we are going to primarily be concerned with early on. That is the Franks who are moving south, and the Saxons who are moving west into England. In this lecture, we are going to deal mostly with the Franks, but in the coming lectures, we will also discuss the Saxons. These, of course, are the northern Germanic tribes that are on the move in this post-Roman world. The Western Roman Empire itself had ceased to exist for all intents and purposes for about a century. It's important to note that it's not as if the people in these areas thought of themselves as something else. They still considered themselves Romans and still retained many of the customs and traditions of the Romans. So again, these lines are very blurred. In fact, many Germanic warriors fought in the Roman army and were trained by the Romans themselves. The area that we are primarily concerned with in this lecture is Gaul. Gaul, of course, was the Roman province that compromised an area that roughly corresponds to modern day France. Now, I want to point out early on that there are a lot of misconceptions about the Franks, and for that matter, many of the Germanic tribes in general, that they were somehow these violent thug barbarians. And there is an aspect to that which is very true. But also, they had a government, they had an administration, and they even had a currency. Part of the reason for this misconception is the fact that the people writing about the Franks were Romans. Procopius, who was one of the last ancient Roman historians, was writing about the Franks from Byzantium. And there was also Gregory of Tours, who is the primary source on the Franks. And they portrayed the Franks as very violent and in many ways backwards. So again, we will be looking at the Franks and we will be looking at the Saxons. These are the two big groups in the early Middle Ages. The Franks, once again, are moving into modern-day France, and the Saxons are moving into modern-day England. It's important to note that France and England did not exist as we know them today as nations. That would not happen for many more centuries. So this is before we had a concept of the nation-state. But this is what is happening in the early Middle Ages. Rome no longer controls these provinces, and these northern Germanic tribes are taking over as the new rulers. So it's better to think of this as a transitionary period, that is, a transition from the Roman Empire to the nation-states in Europe. The Franks and Saxons would play a huge role in the eventual formation of modern-day France and England. So let's get started with the Franks. The Franks, like many other Germanic tribes, buried their dead warriors with their weapons. As a result, many Frankish weapons have been discovered and analyzed from Frankish graves. These have been discovered all around Europe. So it's quite apparent just how important the weapon was to the Franks. Similar to classical armies, the spear was an important weapon for the Franks. The Frankish spear was sometimes referred to as the Angon, and this was essentially a short spear. The Angon was very similar to the short spear used by the Romans. The neck was made of iron, and the length of the spear was about six feet. Similar to the Romans, the Franks opened up battle by hurling the Angon at their enemy. Along with the spear, a typical Frankish warrior would also carry a sword and a knife for close quarter combat. One of the favored weapons of the Franks was the short axe. This was referred to as the Francisca. You can see here the very distinctive arch-shaped head of the Francisca. They could use this not only as a melee weapon, but also as a projectile. And this caused lots of problems for the enemies of the Franks. The Franks apparently were so adept with the Francisca they could split an enemy's shield right in half. Here is an account from the Byzantine historian Procopius. Each man carried a sword and shield and an axe. Now the iron head of this weapon was thick and exceedingly sharp on both sides, while the wooden handle was very short. And they are accustomed always to throw these axes at one signal in the first charge, and thus shatter the shields of the enemy and kill the men. Here is another account from Agathias. The Franks are a tall race and clad in garments which fit them closely. A belt encircles their waist. They hurl their axes and cast their spears with great force, never missing their aim. They manage their shields with much address and rush on the enemy with such velocity that they seem to fly more rapidly with their javelins. They accustom themselves to warfare from their earliest years. And if overpowered by the multitude of their enemies, they meet their end without fear. Even in death, their features retain the expression of their indomitable valor. So I think you get an idea of just how fierce the Franks were. As I mentioned a few videos ago, the first major dynasty of the Franks was the Merovingians. The name is derived from the semi-legendary ruler Merovic. Merovic had a son named Kilderic. Kilderic was the king of the Salian Franks. You can see on this map there are two groupings of the early Franks. 
the Salian Franks, and the Riparian Franks. You can also see this movement of the Salian Franks into Roman Gaul around 440 BC. Kilderic was able to defeat the Visigoths in northern Gaul. This allowed the Salian Franks to establish a base of operations in that area. Kilderic died in 482 and was succeeded by his son Clovis. Clovis was not exactly in a great position. He was surrounded by larger and far more dangerous kingdoms. To the east were the fierce Alamanni. To the south was the kingdom of Soissons. This was the last enclave of Romans in Gaul. Clovis, like his father, was intent on pushing further south into Gaul. The first target was the kingdom of Soissons. Clovis wanted to attack this last Roman holdout, despite being heavily outnumbered. As I mentioned before, this territory was one of the last remnants of the Western Roman Empire outside of Italy. It was administered by the Roman general Siagrius, who was the last Roman general in Gaul. He had ruled this area since 465, and continued to rule this area after the last Roman emperor was deposed in 476. As I mentioned, the capital was located in Soissons, thus the name Kingdom of Soissons. As you can see on this map, the Salian Franks under Clovis were to the north, with the Visigoths to the south. So this last remnant of the Western Roman Empire in Gaul was effectively surrounded. This was some absolutely beautiful territory that Clovis hoped to add to his kingdom. In the decades prior, this last Roman state was too powerful to be defeated outright, but by now Clovis felt strong enough to launch an attack. Clovis was able to enlist a Frankish relative of his, Ragnacar, and with that Clovis sent an invitation to Siagrius for battle. According to Gregory of Tours, Siagrius wasted no time and accepted Clovis' invitation. Siagrius was confident his Roman army would have little trouble against the much smaller Frankish army. But in a shocking setback, the Roman army was crushed, and Siagrius fled the battlefield seeking refuge with the Visigoths in the south. The Visigoths still held a majority of Gaul, but the swift defeat of the Romans convinced the Visigoths that the Salian Franks were a serious threat. If Alaric, the king of the Visigoths, protected Siagrius, it likely would have meant war with the Franks. In the end, Alaric decided not to provoke the Franks and sent Siagrius to Clovis in chains. Clovis ordered Siagrius' execution to be held in secret, and with that, Clovis had greatly expanded his kingdom all the way to the Loire River. He would make Paris the capital of his growing kingdom. As Clovis was making his way through this last Roman state, he sacked several churches which Gregory of Tours refers to as a, quote, heathen heir. Gregory reveals an interesting incident that occurred during the Franks' victory tour. A rather large and beautiful vase was looted from a Catholic church. The bishop of the church sent messengers asking Clovis to kindly return the vase. Clovis promised to do so when the war booty was divided up at Soissons. By the way, it was a Germanic tradition for the king and his warriors to divide up any plunder that had been won. During the meeting to divide up the loot, Clovis asked his army if he could keep the vase in addition to his normal share. Everyone agreed except for one young warrior who in anger struck the vase with his battle axe. He then boldly said to Clovis, quote, You shall get nothing here except what the lot fairly bestows upon you. Clovis maintained his composure and apparently remained silent. Later, Clovis was reviewing his troops that were lined up in battle formation. Clovis spotted the young warrior that earlier had defied him. Clovis seized his axe and struck him down where he stood. Clovis said, quote, This is what you did at Soissons to the vase. Gregory of Tours relates that this incident had the effect of, quote, raising great dread among his troops. One thing I think we can take from this is that these early Frankish kings had no problem getting their hands dirty, as the saying goes. These were chaotic times and a Germanic king needed to have an iron will in order to survive in this post-Roman world. And certainly Clovis seems to have possessed an iron will. Now one question that arises here is why didn't Clovis strike down the defiant warrior when the loot was being split up? I think this was because Clovis didn't want to violate Germanic tradition. It was tradition that the loot be split up evenly, and therefore, technically, the young warrior was correct. So Clovis waited for the opportune moment when he could seek his revenge. Germanic traditions and customs were very important to the Franks. This would remain the case for nearly a thousand years. At this point, according to Gregory of Tours, Clovis in 493 decided to marry a young princess named Clotilda. Clotilda was a Christian and wanted to baptize their first son as such. She boldly told Clovis, quote, The gods you worship are nothing, and they will be unable to help themselves or anyone else, for they are graven out of stone or wood or some metal, and the names you have given them are names of men and not of gods. Well, Clovis did what any king might do and refused to listen. 
their son would not be baptized Christian, and that was final. Clotilda, though, had other plans, and had her son baptized in secret. Shortly after the baptism, however, the boy died. Clovis flew into a tirade after learning what his wife had done. Quote, if the boy had been dedicated in the name of my gods, he would certainly have lived. But as it is, since he was baptized in the name of your god, he could not live at all. Clotilda had another son and once again baptized him Christian. The son soon fell ill, but according to Gregory, after many prayers, the son soon recovered. Clotilda used this opportunity to once again go to work on Clovis and attempt to convert him to what Gregory refers to as the, quote, true god, but Clovis still refused. In 496, the Alemanni attacked the Riparian Franks near the Rhine. The Riparian Franks immediately asked Clovis for help. Clovis raised an army and marched against the Alemanni. The ensuing battle with the Alemanni was one of the fiercest battles Clovis ever fought. The battle hung in the balance. During the brutal fight, Clovis vowed to convert to Christianity if the Franks defeated the Alemanni. Soon thereafter, the Franks routed the Alemanni. Clovis credited his great victory to the vow that he had taken during the battle. And so he kept his own promise and converted to Christianity. An elaborate ceremony was held in Reims on Christmas Day in 496. Gregory of Tours provides a description of this very important moment in history. The squares were shaded with tapestry canopies. The church adorned with white curtains. And the whole shrine of the baptistry was filled with a divine fragrance. And the Lord gave such grace to those who stood by that they thought they were placed amid the odors of paradise. And the king was the first to ask to be baptized by the bishop. Another Constantine advanced to the baptismal font to terminate the disease of ancient leprosy and wash away with fresh water the foul spots that had been long been born. Well, that must have been quite a spectacle, but in reality I think it served several purposes. First, the Catholic Church found a very powerful protector in Clovis. All the other Germanic tribes had been converted to Arianism, which taught that the father and son were different entities, and furthermore that the son was subordinate to the father. Catholics believed in the Trinity, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all the same. This also served a purpose for Clovis. First, he could distinguish himself from the other Germanic tribes that were Aryan. And also it made sense from a practical standpoint. Roman Gaul had been primarily Christian, and so it made sense to get the Christian nobles and bishops on his side. In addition, it gave Clovis justification to Christianize new territories, as well as eradicate Arianism. Clovis now sought to conquer the rest of Gaul in the south, and now he had the justification. The Visigoths, after all, were Arians, something the Catholic clergy had branded as heresy. The Frankish army met the Visigothic army near Vienne. The two armies engaged in brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. Gregory of Tours relates that Clovis himself killed Alaric, who was the king of the Visigoths. At that point, with their king dead, the Visigothic army broke ranks and fled the battlefield. The Franks were now the undisputed masters of Gaul and became a dominant force in the early Middle Ages. Frankish territory now extended all the way to the Pyrenees Mountains. The Visigoths retreated back into modern-day Spain, where they would remain in power until the Moorish invasions nearly two and a half centuries later. Ironically, it was their old foe, the Franks, who would halt the Moorish expansion. Clovis spent his final years eliminating any potential rivals to his throne. This represents the more brutal side to Clovis's rule. One target was the Frankish king, Carrick. Decades earlier, Carrick had been summoned by Clovis to assist him in his battle against the Roman general, Siagrius. But Carrick decided to remain on the sidelines to form an alliance with the eventual victor. Clovis apparently never forgot about this incident. As a result, he imprisoned Carrick. Carrick's son was also taken prisoner. Eventually, Clovis had both of them put to death. This allowed Clovis to seize their kingdom and treasury. Clovis's next target was Ragnarkar. Ragnarkar had actually answered Clovis's summon and aided him many times in battle, but that apparently was not enough to save him. Gregory describes Ragnarkar as, quote, a man so unrestrained in his wantonness that he scarcely had mercy for his own near relatives. Clovis eventually marched against Ragnarkar and easily defeated his army. Ragnarkar attempted to flee, but was captured by his own troops. He was brought before Clovis with his hands tied behind his back. Gregory relates that Clovis said, quote, Why have you humiliated our family in permitting yourself to be bound? It would have been better for you to die. And raising his axe, he dashed it against his head. And he turned to his brother and said, quote, If you had aided your brother, he would not have been bound. And in the same way, he smote him with his axe and killed him. 
after this Clovis had few rivals, but apparently he still remained quite paranoid of plots and potential rivals. He gathered his followers and said, quote, Woe to me who have remained as a stranger among foreigners, and have none of my kinsmen to give me aid if adversity comes. Gregory indicates that this was in reality a clever ruse on Clovis's part, and that if someone stood forward, he might, quote, find someone still to kill. I think if I had been at that gathering, I might have taken one step backwards. Clovis likely died in 511 AD. Other writings have suggested 513. In any event, Clovis created a vast kingdom during his own lifetime, a kingdom that included almost all of Gaul and parts of western Germany. Today, the French consider him the founder of modern-day France. 